So, you know, it's, it's important to understand this issue of God's wrath is against men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. God, and you know, and we know God has made himself known. Creation, we have a conscience. See, these are multiple testimonies, aren't they? We have the word of God. Uh, you know, there was a time when there was no scripture. But scripture talks about, about uh, back in the Psalms, it talks about, you know, his creation uttering speech. So there was a time when apparently there was more of a, a testimony from the heavens. But, you know, that has been replaced in some ways by the word of God. I'm not going to get into some of these things. I'm just saying that the, the overwhelming testimony today is the word of God. And the word of God working in saints. So there's an overwhelming testimony how God has made himself known. And, you know, when we read, and let's uh, read a couple more verses. Uh, Jeremy, would you, would you read um, verses 21 through 23? Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Okay. Well, you know, what we need to understand is the doctrine of volition. What, what, what is volition? Free will. Free will. The ability to make a choice, the ability to believe in God, the ability to respond properly to God's word. That is volition. But all through the Bible, you know, so at some point in time, maybe we'll do a study on the doctrine of volition. But, you know, even the angels were given volition. They were given volition. They had the ability to make a choice to follow the living God, the possessor of heaven and earth, the most high God. Or to follow Satan. And even Satan had this choice. What, what he was going to do. But the angels made a choice. They had volition. They had the ability to make a choice. And God allowed them to do that. Just like he allows us. That ability. We don't want to ever think. And we'll address this at the near the end of the study. We don't want to ever say or think. That God. There are certain people. They didn't have that ability. And we're going to look at one specific example that people bring up where they say he didn't have the ability to do that. Mm. And just to give you a hint, it's Pharaoh. And we're going to address that issue. Okay. How God hardened his heart. And we know the passage, right? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, we're going to go back and look at who Pharaoh was and what he was attempting to do and how he was how he rejected the word of God. Okay, we're going to look at that. But God has given each one of us volition. And, you know, before I forget, you know, in Romans 1.18, it talks about men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. That's a summary of from 118 through chapter 320. Chapter 1 <laughs> describes men who do not want to have any knowledge of God in their thinking. They do not want to have any knowledge of God. Chapter 2 and the first part of chapter 3 describes men who are trying to justify themselves and excuse the judgment of God according to their own works. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. And that verse explains both of these examples. It's really human good and human evil, right? And so let's let's continue. God gave everyone the ability to choose. And that's what this passage is talking about. He made himself known. Verse 21 says, when they knew God, they knew who God was. Now, whether you think this is this passage in Romans is talking about what developed 
through the first chapters of Genesis, or whether you think it's just manifesting something that is happening today, I think they're both true, that people have the ability to choose. And they have the ability to choose because God gave a message that went forth to the Gentiles, specifically to us today. What is that message? Grace. It's the message of grace. It's the gospel of Christ and the mess and the preaching of the cross. It's the message of God's grace that we can be justified by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. That He paid the price of redemption. He shed His blood at Calvary. And the reason people have volition and can choose is God put His power into that message. That's how we know we can have volition because that. That message of God's grace, the preaching of the cross, can pierce through the darkness that man has in his heart and his mind, heart and soul. Okay? Well, how does God respond to man rejecting the revelation of God and going their own way? How does God respond? He leaves them to themselves. He, he, he leaves them to themselves. He gave them up. You know what? God doesn't force somebody to believe. He doesn't force somebody to be in his kingdom. God values our free choice. He values volition. He lets them go their own way. What they're doing when they reject God, they're heading down the way of the evil man. And they become reprobate. Re I can't say the word. <laughs> reprobates. What's a reprobate? Any thoughts? Somebody just no regard, no regard for authority or That's rules right. or no regard rebel. for authority, no regards for God's institutions, no regard for the word of God, and they become filled with unrighteousness. It's no surprise what is happening in the world today. Verse 29. Uh, Terry, do you want to read verse 29? Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, mal malignity, whispers. Backbiters, haters of God, dis despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Okay, thank you. That describes a reprobate mind, somebody who wants no knowledge of God in their thinking. This is, they become evil. It's, it's human evil. It's, they, you know what, they have no ability to make proper discernments, no the ability to make proper judgments. And, but it's interesting. Verse 32 says something that if, in spite of this, they still have a knowledge of something. They still have some knowledge of something. And I think God imprinted upon their, their soul or their conscience. It says, who knowing the judgment of God, a reprobate, somebody that's filled with unrighteousness, still knows there's a judgment. Isn't that a great testimony that God gave people? Yeah. Well, as we go into chapter two, we're going to see a little bit of a twist. We're going to see uh, the issue of man's self-righteousness. And God's wrath is against them because they are not responding properly to God's righteousness. They, what they're doing is Verse 18 of chapter 1, they're still holding the truth and unrighteousness. And the Apostle Paul, from Romans chapter 2, verse 1, through Romans 3, 20, he lays out five excuses that men come up with to justify themselves and to, to excuse themselves from the judgment of God. Because that's what self-righteousness is, right? You're trying to justify yourself. Well, and there are certain things laid out that we want to touch on 
that are very important. And one is uh, verse two. Uh, read, you want to read verse two? You can read, you hear me? I hear me. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. You you couldn't pick me up on your phone there. Mm, there was a, a problem with that for some. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what was going on chapter there. Chapter two, verse two in Romans. Uh, chapter two, verse two. Um, that we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So the God's judgment is according to what? Truth. Truth. And you know what? God has made his truth known. So we know how God is going to judge. Because he's laid out the word. Of, the Bible is also called the word of truth. He has laid out in his word how he's going to judge. He isn't, it's just a not, it's not an arbitrary judgment. He feels like judging this today and that tomorrow. It's God objectively is telling us how he's going to judge. It's according to truth. It's according to his word. His word is truth. Well, and, and this first section is really talking about relative righteousness. Uh, and verse 3 says, there are people that, that they, they're looking at others, saying, thinking they're better. And the word of God says, you do the same things. It says, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. There's no justification by self-righteousness. Is there? There's no justification. You're going to get the judgment because you hold the truth and unrighteousness. The only justification there is is to trust in the living God to save you from your sins. It's the only, whether it's in Israel's program or in our program. Okay? And you know, there's something very interesting. Um, verse 4 says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? That's what God is holding forth today. His goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering. So God doesn't just see something and says, Oh, I'm going to destroy those people. He's long suffering. He's forbearing. He's putting forth his goodness. And you know, verse 5 tells you um, what people are manifesting in self-righteousness. After thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's judgment is righteous. If there's a day of wrath, and a day of, of judgment. You know, we, we're not going to get into some of the details, just that God is judging righteously. It's according to truth. And self-righteous man despises these things. They just, they just, I mean, they, they want something for themselves, but they despise it when it's going to others. They don't want God to be long-suffering towards other people. That's what self-righteousness produces. It produces hatred for other people. Contempt. You know, I'm going to move over to uh, uh, chapter three because, again, we're just touching on some highlights of this. The wrath of God is revealed in heaven. Okay. Um, you know, as, as we progress in Romans chapter one, two, and three, we see God revealing some things that really should be written upon our souls. And it has to do with that God is righteous when he pours out his judgments, right? He's righteous. We don't want to ever think, well, God was too harsh there. It would be easy to think that, right? And we're going to look at a couple of examples where people actually say that. You hear them when you talk to people today, they'll say things like that. Well, God in the Old Testament, he was mean. He just destroyed nations. And he, you know, he's a God of, you know, he, Sounds like a hateful God. We're gonna we're gonna see that that what they're manifesting is lies. Uh, 
Jason, you want to read chapter 3, verse 4? Actually, uh, verse 3 and 4. But what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effort or without effect? God forbid. Ye, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Okay. When you first read that, Jason, I thought, well, Jason's got a different Bible, but then you corrected. He just read it wrong. Yeah. That one word. So that's, you know, that's, that can happen. I mean, there's differences in King James Bibles. Deborah and I were talking about that earlier. There's sometimes there are real minor differences, and sometimes the word has changed. And I, I've read Bibles where I thought, well, this it doesn't sound right. And sometimes you have to think, I've got to find a different Bible. <laughs> so, you know, this the context of this passage, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, it, these are accusations against God. That's what self-righteousness <laughs> will produce. <laughs> Self-righteousness will blame God for things. That's what Israel did. Israel blamed God. Verse 3 says, What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Now, we don't know the specific application of this verse, if it's something that's going to come up at the great white throne judgment, or if it's what people were saying in Paul's day. We're not quite sure, but... You see that there's an accusation here against God? That God's not faithful? And the Apostle Paul gives the answer to this accusation. Verse 4. God forbid. May it never be. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. You know, when the Apostle Paul says here that that every man is a liar, is he saying everything we say is a lie? No. No. He's saying what? What is he, what do you, could we summarize what he's saying when he says every man a liar? Any thoughts? We have a philosophy that's against God. Okay, that's good. Man does. A philosophy that's against or contrary to God. Contrary to God, yeah. Disagrees with God. So if we if we disagree with God in any point of scripture, we're lying. And we, right? we always fall short. We do fall short. Which causes us not to have the full truth. Okay. Now that should humble us, shouldn't it? It's the word of God working in us and not our ability to discern everything, right? But every man is a liar. We disagree with this book. We're lying. And we're going to look at a couple of examples where people actually, and they know some things about the Bible. And it's it's self-righteousness that does this. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, the, the Apostle Paul is laying out these excuses in great detail because what was being manifested in Paul's day as he writes this are the same things today. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? No. The Apostle Paul says in verse 9, as he's laying out these excuses, there's one excuse that the Gentiles will use and that is manifest in them. What then? Are we better than they? The Apostle Paul has been looking back at Israel and saying they failed miserably. They ended up accusing God. And this last excuse is, well, we have evolved way beyond that. We're, we're not as bad as Israel was. And the Apostle Paul says, we've before, we proved before that we're all under sin. He goes back to the Old Testament scriptures when it uses scriptures that say all men have sinned. It's an application is not just to Israel, it's to everybody. So I encourage you to go back and look at these verses. Uh, and he sometimes he's looking at verses, and sometimes, sometimes he makes a summary statement. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Does that include us today? Yeah. 
None, no one. It includes everybody, right? Verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. This includes the most self-righteous, wise person in the world today. There's none that doeth good. Well, you know, it's important to understand why the Apostle Paul is laying out these doctrines. Uh, some of us got saved at a very early age, right? right. I think I was saved maybe about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, I wasn't out in the world and functioning a certain way. But we need to know what we were saved from, no matter how old we were, how old we were. We were saved from the, 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 the bondage of sin and the penalty of sin. We were, we were saved from the wrath to come. God saved us from that. And, you know, as we're being educated in these things, as we go through Romans, we're actually being educated so that we can eventually function as a faithful ambassador. We need to know the, the attacks that are going to come. And they do come, don't they? Yes. We've all experienced these things. Uh, Jason, you were talking about some things. Maybe it was a saint, but he had an attack against what we would call sound doctrine, against Paul's distinct Gentile apostleship, against the, the mystery of God's purpose and program for today for the church, the body of Christ. Can you still hear me uh, uh, read? Jerry? I think I might have lost them. Nope. Uh, so it's important to know why these doctrines are so important. And the Apostle Paul, as he gets to the, as he gets to chapter three, verses nineteen and twenty, he makes a summary summary statements about the law, not just for us, but for anybody living under that law. He says. Verse 19, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. That's what the law was designed to produce in Israel. It would stop them. They, they, they would fall on their faces and they would say, Lord, save us. Save us. We cannot do these things. And in their, their heart, a heart of faith would have said, said that to the Lord God. That doesn't mean they didn't need to keep the law. That's the program God put them under. But justification has always been my faith, my grace through faith. And we're going to see the, the Apostle Paul talks a great deal about Israel and the next couple chapters and the proper response and his the validity of his ministry as he goes back to the Old Testament. There's something consistent with what Paul teaches that's consistent with the Old Testament. And we'll get to that. That's in chapter four. That's, we're going to cover that next week in some of these issues of the doctrines of justification. So, and then he says in verse 20, actually, the next thing he says in 19 is that every, I think I read this, that every mouth may be stopped. Yeah. Um, and all the world may become guilty before God. What the law produced was a guiltiness before God if they responded properly. Otherwise, it produced self righteousness, like the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. So I want to look at a couple particular examples of lies that our world manifests against the word of God, against God's character, against his faithfulness, against his long suffering and kindness. Uh, and it has to do with how God dealt with the nations in the Old Testament and how we dealt with individuals. So the first one we'll look at is Pharaoh. Turn back to Exodus chapter 1. You know, sometimes it's brought up, and it's sometimes brought up by religious people. Well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What is, what's, why did he do that? And what they're doing is they're calling God into question about something he had the right to do. He had the right to do. Uh, Exodus chapter 1. And we also... Hold your place there and turn over to Isaiah chapter 52. Exodus 1 and Isaiah 52. 
very important that we have this understanding in our heart. Otherwise, we can be influenced by these lies. And they're lies, they're lies against God's character and against his, his faithfulness and his goodness. Uh, Deborah, do you want to read Exodus chapter 1? Um, read verse uh, read verse 8 now there rose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph okay so God brought his people down into Egypt they were there 430 years and they were afflicted for 400 years so right, right after they came they started to be afflicted well there arose a king who knew not Joseph. That's a different, it was a king who determined to do something. Hold your place there in Exodus 1 and turn over to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. Cheryl, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you read uh, Isaiah 52? If I can find it, I will. <laughs> I'll help you, it's in the Old Testament. Yeah, I'm flipping. <laughs> Isaiah 52 verse 4 42 I'm getting there okay got it for thus says the Lord God my went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there and the Assyrians oppressed him without cause okay talks about God's people uh, they went down a time into Egypt to sojourn there. And who was it that afflicted them? Was it, did it say Pharaoh? No, it says Assyrian. The Assyrian. You know, what we need to understand is Satan had a plan. And his plan was a certain individual he was going to bring down there to do something God's people. It was, he was brought down to destroy God's people. He wasn't a man that was looking for truth, that cared about God's people. And we see that back in Exodus chapter 1, he begins to set about to destroy God's people. You remember specifically what he did to destroy God's people? He, he killed all the firstborn, or all the boys, he the young men. He set about to murder all the firstborn males in Israel. Actually, it was all the males, right? All, all the males, right. He, he, he yeah. set about to do this. He was, and what he's doing is what's talked about later is he began to construct an iron furnace to destroy God's people. Does that, does that put some things in perspective about how God dealt with Pharaoh? Does it? Yeah. Why God dealt with them the way he did? He raised Pharaoh up to show his power. There's a man who rejected the word of God. He rejected the Lord God himself. He rejected God's people. He set about to destroy God's people. He's Satan's man. That's, we need to understand that. He is Satan's man. So when people bring up something, well, God hardened his heart. God, he didn't have the ability to respond. You know what? These are lies. These are lies. And I know sometimes people bring things up because they don't understand things, but it comes out of questioning God's goodness and his faithfulness, right? That's important. The other issue to understand is how God dealt with nations. What is sometimes thought about how God dealt with nations in the Old Testament? Ruthlessly. Yeah, he's killing women and children, they were saying. It's ruthless. Yeah. Did you hear? We said it was ruthless. You're killing ruthless. Reed said children, killing, killing women, women and children. Women and children. Yeah, out whole just entire. arbitrarily destroying nations. I mean, he didn't like these people. He, he didn't like these people. You know what? We're going to look at a passage over in Jonah that talks about God's attitude towards the nations. He had an attitude. Uh, turn over to the book of Jonah. And, you know, these are things 
And I'm not saying we're espousing these things, but it's possible to be influenced by these things where we begin to question God's goodness and his long suffering and his kindness. And that, you know, over in Hebrews, it says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God hasn't changed, has he? He's always, he's always been a God of goodness. And, you know, you think of the John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But he was going to save it through Israel. That's the prophetic program. It was through Israel. <clears throat> so turn over to Jonah. And then we're going to close with this a passage. Jonah's one of those books that hides. Or <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, uh, Jonah. Um, um, let's see. Um, read. you want to read a verse? Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> what do you want me to read? Read Jonah chapter 1, verse 2. Jonah chapter 1, verse 2. Yeah. We're like having trouble with it today, tonight. You know what? One, two. Just one. One scripture to give me. Chapter one, verse two, and Jonah. Uh, uh, arise, go, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness come up before me. Okay, their wickedness. It was a wicked city. Uh, turn over to chapter three, verse eight. It says, "But let man and this is Nineveh responds to Jonah's preaching." Verse eight. Well, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. It was an evil, violent city. God sent Noah there to preach to them. Noah? God sent <laughs> Jonah to preach to them. I said that. I was checking to see if anyone would catch that. No, that was a old person. No, I was directing the room. God sends Jonah to Nineveh. Good thing for the he, other old person to catch. He cares about the Gentiles. Do you see that? He cares about. He wanted them. And why did Jonah not want to go? Because he he, he wasn't was, interested in the Gentiles. He wasn't interested in the Gentiles, but he also had some interesting that God was going to use those nations, those mighty nations in the east. To come against Israel to reprove them. He knew that. He didn't want them to do that, so he didn't go. At four verse two. Right, we're going to read that right now. Oh. You want to read chapter four verse two, one? Okay. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, "I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before in, unto Tarshish." For I knew that thou wert a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Okay, that is a very important verse, isn't it? Yeah. I, you know, Jonah says, I knew something about you, Lord. It has to do with the Lord Jehovah. He knew something about Jehovah's name. It's a, it, his, his, his grace and his Jehovahness to be merciful and kind, that he knows that God is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And then it says this, and repentest thee of the evil. Well, that's something we need to have a proper understanding of because, you know, evil is used in different ways in the Bible. When it says God sending out evil. It's talking about calamity, destruction. It's not saying that there's evil in God. It's talking about calamity. That's the evil concept that comes out from God. Calamity, the, the judgment, uh, the, the results of uh, his, his wrath is calamity, judgment, evil. Does that make sense? But, right. you know, as, as you go through the Old Testament, God manifests that he's long suffering <clears throat> he dealt with wicked nations for a long time and you know what they had the opportunity to be influenced 
by certain messengers and certain things that God did. They had the opportunity to do something. Even when the nations were going to be destroyed, if somebody believed the God of Israel and God's going to come in and destroy those nations, what should they have done? Turn to God. <laughs> pray. Say that again, Joe. I said, turn to God and pray. Turn to God. They had, they could have separated from that nation. They could have said, I don't want I don't want to be judged with this nation. I'm out of here. But you're right. They could have turned to God, and that's what that's what uh, what's her name in um, um, the book of Judges or not uh, Joshua? What is the uh, Rahab? Right. Rahab does. She responds in faith to the God of Israel. She believes the God of Israel, and then she does something, and she gets a reward. So God had provision even when he was going to go in and destroy these nations, if they would have responded properly. So, you know, it's, it's important to have this, the understanding how God was dealing in the Old Testament. He was slow to anger. He was merciful. He was gracious. And he was long suffering. What is long suffering? Turn the words around. Suffering a long time. Suffering for a long time. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You know what? God is suffering today. We need to understand that. Um, and God is long suffering. You know, there's even though God was long suffering <clears throat> back there in the Old Testament, he was forbearing and he's manifesting his goodness. There's there's something about this present time period where there don't seem to be any limits to his long suffering and forbearance, do there? The only limitation seems to be people's response, whether there's a response. And as long as people keep responding, it, there's no limit to his long suffering. So it's important to know these things and that these things are formed in us as and we're being properly educated. And, you know, as I go, as I went back and studied some of these things, I found myself thinking, wow. God is so kind and gracious and long suffering with man, and he's made himself known and he allows people to go their own way. It's, it's just amazing to think about how gracious and kind God is. So I'm gonna stop there. Any any thoughts on anything we went over? I guess not not from this house. <laughs> Where's Terry? She's here. She's listening. Okay, good. Good. Any any thoughts or any things anybody has to share? Anything? Maybe even something we didn't go over that's in that section of scripture. <clears throat> it, it's just a great way to end. It's all these things that the world will bring against us and they'll say about God because they don't understand or anything that those things have been fully manifest. But then to end... With, with a gracious God, a merciful God, slow to anger, and a great kindness, and this other evil thing. It's just a, a great God and a reminder that we serve. That's right. That's right. And, you know, these things come out of God's glory. If you go back to when Moses says, show me thy glory, it's, he talks about being, being gracious and merciful, abundant in truth. But then he says he will... He will he will punish the wicked. So God's God's glory, God's judgment is out of his glory. But it's based on him being long suffering and kind and gracious. If, if people continue to reject part of God's glory says, I have to, I have to judge and punish the wicked. Should that be a comfort to us or trouble us? Comfort. comfort should comfort us god's going to make things right he's going to deal with the evil in the world and the the rejection and there's a lot of evil in this world he's going to deal with he's going to deal with unrepentant um we can i think it can be both comforting for us but then still troubling for all those that don't yeah because of the fear the fear of judgment sure. we can have that same long suffering right that's right.
and we should we should have the same attitude towards mankind that God does. And that's what that, that's what Romans is designed to produce in us, the mind of Christ. When we get to the end of Romans, we'll see that. that Eternal okay, I'm going to stop it there. I'm sorry, Reed, you were saying something and I couldn't... Oh, 